as you recall, not only do we have convergent plate boundaries, but in terms of the atmosphere, we've got convergent air masses. In the case of the, the global pressure belts, the intertropical convergence zone, or that equatorial low pressure trough, I've emphasized this numerous times, a dense rain belt that we find somewhere there along or near the equator where we have a predominant low pressure that's there year round. Low pressure, once again, wet, precipitation. We should think of low pressure as being very much areas we get a lot of rain. And so here we have air flowing in the same direction, converging. And in the case of this particular area, you got a lot of warm, moist air that converges that's eventually going to rise, condense, cool as it rises and fall back down as rain, creating this uh, uh, rain belt. But then as you go farther away from uh, this particular uh, uh, convergence, we have high pressures dry areas, and that explains the world's deserts. So once again, emphasizing this idea of convergence on this side view of our atmosphere. But as we've learned, this intertropical convergence zone, or this dense rain belt, it moves. And so during the summer months, it moves to the north. And so it moves over, would say, 10 degrees north, 15 degrees north. And so what that means is those places now suddenly get a huge amount of rain during their summertime. So it's very important to keep in mind that this dense rain belt moves throughout the year. Now we have the other time of the year, the winter, in which the uh, intertropical convergence zone, that dense rain belt, has moved south of the equator, leaving here at 15 degrees north, uh, where we just were getting dense, you know, a heavy amount of rain. Now we're extremely dry because we're underneath a high pressure. Another way to visualize just what I said is now looking at the global view. So essentially looking at as if we're from space, where beforehand we're kind of looking at the side view of our atmosphere. And so once again, that equatorial low pressure trough, we've got that white uh, dashed line, which is South Asia, uh, the yellow dashed line. That's where we are, Indianapolis. Uh, so that dashed white line, South Asia, we can see during June, it's underneath the equatorial low pressure. So it gets a huge amount of rain. And then now by December, everything then shifts to the south. And so here we see South Asia, uh, that white dashed line, it didn't move, but the global air pressure belts did move. And so now in the winter time, they're dominated by a pronounced high pressure. So what we have going on here is we have a pattern of in the summertime, ITCZ being overhead, so a lot of rain, whereas then in the winter time, uh, the subtropical high pressure moves over and so it gets quite dry. Now in the precipitation map, as we can see in the South Asia region for January, the winter time, uh, we don't see uh, much precipitation. We do see some there along the Himalayans, uh, a little bit there in Sri Lanka. Uh, so some of that relates to upland features, just the natural when we get any air, even if it's got just a little bit of moisture that comes in, it's eventually going to get lifted and cooled. Uh, but for, for the most part, we see in, in the wintertime, South Asia is extremely dry, very important. Whoa, we have a major difference here come the summertime. Now we have a lot amount of rain, in particular there along the eastern part of South Asia and, of course, the western Ghats. So what we have here is we have a pronounced pattern that I hope I've emphasized using these different uh, uh, models of the air pressure belts that move, but also we look at the precipitation map comparing winter to summer, a huge difference. What explains this? the whole monsoon effect. Very important, monsoon, an often misused term. Monsoon is a seasonal reversal of wind. So it doesn't mean explicitly that it's a rain event. Now we have two different types of monsoons. We have a wet monsoon and a dry monsoon. So it's just a seasonal shift in the wind patterns. What I have here is I'm trying to showcase are once again the upland features and they're in yellow, uh, but that red line that moves and kind of meanders, that is the intertropical convergence zone. And so air is converging. And so wherever that red line is, arrows are going or the air is going towards that red line. And so what we can see here is the arrows, a lot of them are coming off of a warm, moist uh, water body, the Indian Ocean, the Arabian Sea, the Bay of Bengal. And so it's bringing with it warm, moist air that's coming onto the Indian subcontinent and then comes and interacts with those upland features. And so what we have is we've this, this pronounced pattern of warm, moist air moving essentially would say from the southwest to the northeast, 
blowing from the Indian Ocean, typically beginning oh, more like June, but the season is April to October, but really June is the start of it. And this is where 80% of the rainfall for South Asia comes from. And so the torrential rains and floods of this particular pattern of warm moist air moving over uh, the Indian subcontinent and then interacting with uplands, we're gonna get a huge amount of orographic precipitation. So we have here the wet monsoon. So this is a right usage of the term, a major rain event. So much of a rain event, this is not just a, a couple days or a couple weeks. This is a, you know, April to October, a good chunk of the year in which we have a huge amount of rain falling uh, in South Asia. So here we have Marmas from India, I probably pronounced that wrong, but who cares? We have the, the number one in terms of the largest amount of rainfall is in this one particular area, they get 39 feet of rain per year, which is fascinating because it's really April to October where they get most of their rain. So they get most of their rain during this one particular time, which helps them become number one overall. So why are they number one? First, we have the wet monsoon season, the moist air from nearby water sources. So we have the Bay of Bengal bringing that warm moist air and it comes quickly and interacts with the Himalayan mountains. And so we have the Himalayan mountains we have a huge amount of, 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 of orographic precipitation happening here because we have mountainous features on both sides of that star. So you can see on, on the north side of the star, but also on the east side of that star, we have upland areas, which creates orographic precipitation. So it's almost like what happens is the wind patterns kind of tunnel and come right through where the star area is and then combined with nearby upland uh, uh, features, we get orographic precipitation. So really the topography almost puts this pathway of fast moving air that comes you know, through this little gap, uh, creating a huge amount of warm moist air that interacts with upland features and orographic precipitation. Now I return to our topographic profile of South Asia, and I insert kind of the predominant wet monsoon wind patterns as they come from off of the uh, Arabian Sea or the Indian Ocean, come off and come onto the Indian subcontinent, and then interact with the Himalayan mountains. And that explains why we get that huge amount of rain on the Western Ghats, but also there in the Himalayan mountains. And so this helps to fill that Ganges River Valley and gives it that precipitation, or sorry, gives it that water source, that freshwater source uh, that's so vital to this particular region, which causes it to be highly populated, but very agriculturally productive. But the pattern then changes come the dry monsoon, come the winter time of October to April, in which the dominant wind patterns shift. Once again, a monsoon is a seasonal shift in winds. That's all it is. Now it has a dry component and a wet component. We call it the dry monsoon or the wet monsoon. Already explained the wet monsoon. So actually when, so, when you could say that a monsoon is a prolonged, prolonged drought period. Uh, and so that's kind of should blow your mind. We've always used the term monsoon to say rain, but actually monsoon also means uh, a pronounced dry period if we call it a dry monsoon. And so here the pattern is the wind shift. We can see that red line now moves over the Indian Ocean. So the air comes from the continent but the continents aren't produced in water, and then moves from the continent across the Indian subcontinent and then offshore uh, to the Indian Ocean. So because it's bringing with it dry air, we then get a pronounced dry period from October to April in South Asia. The point of this is just to show how often confused, often misused term, monsoon. Trust me, in Indiana, we are not going to see the monsoon effect. It is not a pronounced four or five months constant rain period uh, that we see here. Here we have a bar graph that shows rain fall throughout the year in one of these cities of South Asia in India called Kolkata, also uh, referred to as Calcutta, uh, but Kolkata. Uh, what you see at the bottom is JFM, all of those, those are the, the, the months of the year. So beginning with January, February, March, April, and of course ending with December. And we can see a definite period of higher amount of rainfall uh, there in, in the summertime compared to a drier period uh, there in uh, November uh, to April. Here's a picture from Calcutta during the wet monsoon season. Pretty obvious why we know that. Uh, but during this time period, uh, yeah, it is a nuisance, no doubt about that. 
uh, this isn't the cleanest of cities. And so just imagine uh, the sewer and all that with all the backup and probably not the cleanest of water. Uh, I wouldn't suggest you know my children to uh, go out and play in the water. Uh, so obviously a nuisance for this cabbie as far or this, uh, this taxi uh, for moving uh, people from one place to another. Uh, but look, everyone's happy. Uh, in the wet monsoon season, actually it's something that's a positive. It's something it's looked forward to. It's what they view as a source of life. Here we see an aerial photo of the wet monsoon season and the dry monsoon season, so two different time periods of the year, uh, but of the same place, the same vantage point. Uh, on the left-hand side of the image is the Indus River, and so essentially at the northern part of this particular image of both of these is the Indus River uh, and the Thar, or the Great Indian Deserts. We can see during the wet monsoon season, the green, the countryside uh, green, greens up. Uh, we can see the river very clearly as it meanders its way uh, through Pakistan, uh, whereas in the dry monsoon season, it's very faint, uh, but also very, you know, much uh, less green. Uh, more brown uh, there in the dry monsoon season. So the countryside essentially turns green during this period and the dry season dust and dirt is washed away from that 60 plus straight days of rain that we find during the wet monsoon. And here we'll see a before and after pic. So here's during the wet monsoon and that same vantage point during the dry monsoon. So we can see a pronounced difference. Very important to consider also the fact that this monsoon period, it shifts and it's, it's, we have a predictable pattern in terms of the time of year, but sometimes it comes early, sometimes it comes late, uh, sometimes it comes in huge amounts, sometimes it comes kind of sprinkled throughout the, uh, the you know, throughout much of the uh, monsoon period. That's one of the things we think about agricultural areas is where it thrives a lot, where a lot of people work in agriculture, you know, two thirds of the population. So this is very important to keep in mind is this shifting pattern and how much of an importance it is for actually the everyday lives of the people.